Welcome to the My Broadband channel and uh, my name is Zaki Anastasi. In this series of What Next, we are going to be talking to different entrepreneurs, uh, captains of industry, people in the tech industry that are making a massive difference in the world that we're living in today, reflecting on, on what is the situation now that, you know, we're calling this, uh, I don't know, the new tomorrow, the, uh, what are the other words that people are using, the What Next uh, the new normal, you name it what it is, but we are in the situation that we're in. And it's a great privilege to welcome Michael Jordan, who is a serial entrepreneur. You might know him as uh, the former CEO of FNB, but he has his finger in many pies. Michael, it's it's so good to see you again. Um, and 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 how are you firstly? And uh, how is, um, you know, how has the uh, lockdown been treating you? Hi, Aki. It's actually also nice seeing you again. I, I'm actually very well. I think one of the lessons that I learned early on in the lockdown is it's really also important to look after yourself. If you don't look after yourself, you can't look after others and you can't look after your business. So getting enough exercise, for example, was important. And I'm lucky to live on a farm where, where that was actually at my disposal. Uh, and also lucky to live with a you know, lovely family and be able to have time to think. You know, oftentimes we're so busy that you don't take the time to read and to deeply think. So yeah. it's how you use these circumstances that's important. So, Michael, I mean, uh, since we, I mean, we've spoken in between, but you obviously played a major role in, in shaping F&B to where it is today. Um, but since you've left the bank, you've been involved in all sorts of things. Um, one of them is rain. What have you been up to uh, since, since in the last few years? I know I said you're a serial entrepreneur but you've got interests in so many different things and you really, I love your mind and the way you think and the way you invest. So what are you involved in at the moment? You see, I've become by design or by accident, I'm not quite sure, um, a, a backer of other entrepreneurs. You can call it a venture capitalist. I right. just have this basic belief that the best way to create the future um, is to actually create the enterprise around that vision of yours and to yeah. make it sustainable. And, um, and so you can actually uh, you know, make the world a little bit better in every single instance. And you can do it in a way that starts quite small, has to prove itself, you know, has to take risk, and eventually become a big business enterprise, which is, if you think of anyone that's changing the world, whether it's um, uh, Elon Musk with Tesla or what, what you know, somebody's doing with um, Amazon, they all started as seriously small businesses. So I'm hoping to back a few of those. They're all South African-based. And they all solve particular problems that, that I think this country needs solving. Well, I, I've got to say that uh, one of your businesses is Rain. And uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you were the first guys to go commercial with 5G. You've got an interesting network. There's been an incredible uptake. I'm hearing really good stories. Of course, you, you really simplified the world of connectivity when you first introduced those SIM cards, which I have a, a three of them in my businesses as well. And they really are very handy. Um, but 5G, RAIN starting off as a 4G network. It's a data-only network. Tell us where RAIN is and, and, and what the uptake to 5G has been. Well, first of all, Aki, thank you for that, uh, for that ad there. I'll, I'll send you some bottles of wine afterwards. Um, RAIN has indeed been very well in, in uh, this lockdown period. The demand trebled, even quadrupled, so much so that we really had to work on the service delivery um, and, and the backup service there. And of course, it's all part of the demand for data with people working from home or kids doing their education from home. Yes. Um, the team has responded incredibly well, also with a rollout. They now have more than 5,500 um, 4G sites and just under 500 5G sites. And it really is playing to this incredible demand for data. You know, data in the world is growing at 60% compound, has been doing so for more than 10 years and probably will keep on doing so for another 10 years. So... It's not just our work, you know, working from home and the Zooms that we're having now. It's the games. It's the streaming. It really is an unlimited demand. So we're fortunate to be in a position that, that we can actually democratize data. 5G has helped. But I also think simple packages, which just basically give you unlimited access. I mean, you know that if you stream, you don't want to pay per episode. Or if you listen to Spotify or you play Minecraft, you don't want to pay per game. You pay and you eat as much as you want. And we're fortunate that that has um, been met uh, with, with a huge update by South African consumers. 
So, I mean, I'm, I'm curious to know, you mentioned about how many 5G towers you've got um, and, and the uptake has been incredible. What are, are you seeing any interesting trends on what the users have been doing since lockdown? I mean, I, I look at myself, for example, um, and I'm spending a lot more time video conferences like this. I mean, this is the new normal. Probably in the beginning, I was spending like four or five hours a day. Um, but how has that network been? What kind of traffic have you seen? And what are the interesting trends on the, on the RAIN network, both 5G and 4G, I guess? Well, I, I, okay, I need to explain my role. I, I'm not op operationally involved. In fact, I'm the backer of some great people. Willem Roos is the CEO. We've got Brandon and Conrad Lee who run the strategy and the operations. Um, I try and not stick my nose into their business too yeah. much, although, of course, I'm very curious. But the broad trends that I can tell you is that all the towers that were erected for business use, um, yes. that were always very busy during the day, were kind of fallow because the traffic had moved completely into the suburbs as people were working from home. Really? And obviously, it takes some time to then build up those towers. That's the first interesting thing. The second one is when you experience peaks in data usage, which typically is from 6 o'clock in the evening till about 10 o'clock in the evening. Yes. And that's completely changed because people were now using data throughout the entire day, um, which is a completely different change in, in channel usage. And the biggest uses, of course, were Netflix. There was a lot of streaming happening. But people suddenly started video conferencing and working from home. Um, and I think that that is a completely new mindset or paradigm in which white collar workers find themselves. At first, it was awkward to work from home. Now I think that a third of those workers will probably never go back to work in an office building. So it's one of those changes that will stay with us. No, there's no doubt about that. I mean, you look at uh, Twitter, for example, telling you know, their staff, you're never coming back to the office. Microsoft, Google, Facebook, all of these guys say you guys are coming back in December. And even then, I think they're going to renew it. Is, do you think that, I mean, you're an interesting guy in how you work with people and you look at, uh, and you just look at your vision that you've got. Do you really think that this is going to be the new way of doing things? Or as human beings, uh, when we look at our psychology, that we really need to be with people socially all the time? Or are we going to have a mixture of all of these things? When they, when they say this is the new normal, is this the new normal in Michael Jordan's eyes? We, we will find a balance. Uh, and clearly there are people who they just want to get back to the office and they want to talk to somebody over the water cooler, so to speak. And there are certain things in meetings, whether it's your body cues or the things that are said outside of the meeting, that are a very important part of how we do business. Yes. But what we've learned is that you don't have to be there at 8 o'clock in the morning and stay in the office till 5.30 in the afternoon to do a decent day's work. Yeah. Businesses have learned that they can save on expensive office rental costs. Workers or individuals have learned that they don't need to spend all their time in traffic. Um, and that they can actually really get productive things done at home. So I think we'll end up with a mixture of all of this where sometimes you do need the human contact, certain bus businesses value culture, and you can't really develop your complete culture over video conferencing. Yeah. But it'll, it'll have different impacts. I think business travel, for example, particularly international business travel, uh, you know, that really just um, will only be the exception now. It will take many, many years for business travel to get to the same plateau that it did uh, before Corona. Yeah, that's very interesting you say that. And I like what you said about company culture. I think that ultimately is going to be the common thread uh, of successful companies. But when you look at our economy, our economy is in deep trouble. Um, we are, you know, I, I have conversations with a lot of different people. And I know that you have the economy and the economics running through your blood. But what do we need to do to help this economy recover in a rapid pace? Because I'm afraid that if we carry on along the speed that we're going at the moment, it's going to take us decades to recover fully. So if I had to make you finance minister or minister of technology, what would Michael Jordan do to get this economy going again? Well, okay, there's this famous line and it's attributed to a whole lot of people, but the line is basically you mustn't waste a good crisis. And what we've got now is we've got a very big crisis. So it's the opportunity to do big stuff. Um, you know, the stuff that the ideas had always been lying around, but you never got around to. Now is the time to do it. So I would like to see a massive stimulus. First of all, I think we've got to get consumption back up again. And one way to do that is to actually reduce things like the VAT rate. But more importantly for our economy is to get the productive capacity up again. And I can think of many investments that, yeah, that would make sense. For example, infrastructure, roads or dams or housing, you know, for all those people that still don't have houses yet. 
I like, for example, what Germany has done, which was invest in the industries of the future. They said that they're going to give incentives for electric cars, but not petrol cars. And they were backing things like artificial intelligence and the green economy. So these are things, variants of these that we can do in South Africa, which would be to create employment intensive growth. Um, so now's the time for us to do it in South Africa. Tomorrow, incidentally, is the budget uh, speech by the Minister of oh, yeah. Finance. So we'll see what happens there. But, but I really think this is a time probably for the state to take the lead, to be more of a developmental state and to create the right incentives for small businesses, for corporates, and even for state-owned enterprises so that they invest for growth and we create employment to get this economy out of the terrible situation that it's in. You're a very optimistic man. Do you think we can do it? Is it possible or is it just going to be doom and gloom? I, okay, I think one of the things I find the most frustrating in the world is everything is possible. Everything is a choice. Growth is a choice. We just need to make one or two or three, sometimes hard decisions, sometimes unpopular decisions, and then growth happens. Growth is, isn't something esoteric. It really is something that responds to nearly scientific laws. Yes. I'll give you one example. Right now, we're debating whether we should bail out SAA for many more tens of billions of rands on top of the many more tens of billions of rands that we spent on it since 1994. It's yeah. an ideological pet project. But if we took the tough choice and we said, let's let SAA go, I will guarantee you that one or two or three private sector operators will take its place and create the capacity again and create the jobs. And then we have that capital that we can invest in anything from employment creation to education to infrastructure etc all it takes is a decision that we're going to go for growth rather than bail out uh, the old industry so i remain positive i remain optimistic because i know that these things can be done and i'd like to think that this is exactly the crisis that calls for radical action oh, i love what you say and, and you know what through crisis is where you know the, the you know some of the biggest organizations have been born from situations like this and it's interesting when you look at and you listen to different ceos the sentiment out there is that before the lockdown and before corona and i'm talking about globally what seemed impossible to do was yeah. made possible within a week when they said to people you're going to be working from all over the place we have to decentralize the office it was an impossible task to say that would happen before the lockdown yet it became possible. So everyone should be asking themselves, what else is impossible and what else can we do to really achieve these kind of things? So I really do share your optimism. It's quite interesting when you look at the businesses through this corona crisis and the lockdown, um, you know, I've been talking to a few people and it's interesting, the businesses that I've seen, the, believe it or not, there are some businesses that are doing better now than they were doing last year this time. And uh, would you believe it? Uh, one of them is a hardware, the hardware business, because people are yes. at home, they've got more money to spend, they want to fix stuff around their houses. Things like butcheries, uh, things like pet stores, they are doing yes. better turnovers now than they were last year. So, uh, who, who are going to be the big losers um, after this crisis is over? And I, I look at the banks and I look at the share price of the banks and I think that. They should be in big trouble because there's a liquidity crisis. People don't have money. So who, in your view, are there going to be the big losers of this? Yeah, on the banks, before I tell you, I think the losers are, I think our banking system is well capitalized. It's not going to be pretty. I mean, they're going to bear the brunt of lower interest rates, which means lower margins. They're going to have bad debts. Their fee income will be lower. But we're fortunate to have a very strong banking system, and they'll eventually come through with this. But there are other losers that may actually not see the light of day. Um, newspapers, for example, printed newspapers. I mean, there's been a long move towards online news already. I just think some of them are not going to make it. Cinemas, even though they reopen, uh, I don't think people will want to sit in a crowded cinema uh, anymore. Commercial property, um, you know, some people won't have to go to the office to work anymore, so commercial property. Some of the malls, as you see online shopping happening, there'll be, there'll be um, education providers where now suddenly they'll be able to do it online. So the ones that don't adapt fast enough will be the losers. That's the way um, evolution has always worked. And then generally weak balance sheets. You may even have a good business model, but if you are over leveraged to start off with, that's going to be tough. So over leveraged individuals, over leveraged businesses, and even over leveraged countries, countries that have borrowed too much, they're really going to suffer, particularly when interest rates start ticking up again.
Very interesting. I mean, this has really forced everything to fast forward, and including technology. Um, and uh, I think that the technology sector is the one sector that's really coming out strong out of all of this. Um, not all technologies, mind you, but I think that it's really creating a lot of innovation. And, you know, whether it's virtual reality, whether it's going to be holograms in the near future. Um, have you had any aha moments that you've seen during this lockdown that you think to yourself, wow, that is something for, for the future that's going to work. And I know the glue is the connectivity which rain brings, but have you had an aha moment uh, in the last three months, Michael, you're done? So, so basically, I think what has happened is that COVID has just accelerated trends that were in place already and has brought the future forward much faster. So things that would otherwise have taken much, much longer just happened in a couple of weeks. You mentioned the working from home example. I was quite amazed to see my daughter in front of the computer doing online classes the very next day and actually writing an exam on her very first day, which by the way was very cleverly done because there were different questions posed to different students. Even if, if they sat next to each other, they couldn't write off, um, you know, look up the answers from each other. Now for educators to do that, again, had they had a choice, maybe they would have resisted it, but um, they had to absolutely adopt it. Um, the, the same with video conferencing and the number of board meetings that I've had and the meetings that I've had. It used to be awkward, but now that everybody Zooms and from home, it's just become the normal way of doing business. My aha moment, if, they, if uh, it, it's not that profound, is just that I find how much I can do in writing other than in meeting. Asking people to not even phone, not even video conference, but to put things to me in writing. Often they want advice and sometimes by writing to me, they solve the problem just by really thinking deeper about it. Or if somebody writes to me, I have the time to think about it before I write back at them. So my productivity, I can tell you, has gone up significantly during this period. And that isn't even fancy technology. It really is just saying we don't always have to communicate by speaking. We, we can do it in writing as well. That's brilliant. I think we've all had to reevaluate a lot of things during this crisis. I see your bookshelf at the back. There's so many interesting books. Is there is there one interesting book uh, that you've read in the last uh, few months that you could recommend? Anything good? You, you know, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a nerd or a geek. Uh, choose whichever one you want. I, I, I read many, many books. I have a trick that when people recommend a book to me, I immediately order it on Kindle or on Amazon. And then I have a whole stack of books that I can read from at any given time. Um, I've, I've got one book that I would recommend a lot of people read, which is it's called From Zero to One. It's written by a venture capitalist, Peter Thiel. And it's all about creating something where nothing existed before, going from zero to one. And a whole of, lot of counterintuitive advice about one, what one needs to do to create that type of business. So as you can hear, I'm all about startups. I'm all about entrepreneurs. I'm all about creating the new. And I found this a particularly interesting book. Generally, I like all the books about successful entrepreneurs, whether it's Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos or, or Steve Jobs or some of our local heroes, of course, uh, as, as well. So, so anything that inspires about the future, about entrepreneurial individuals who take risk, that's my fascinating stuff. Okay. Listen, I, I, I couldn't resist because you mentioned Zero in that, uh, in that book there, in the book title. And I know there's a bank called Zero coming up, but uh, we, you, I know you can't talk too much about it, but is there anything that, is, uh, that you can tell us about the bank? And, uh, you know, when can we see Bank Zero? And I know you can't talk about it, but, uh, you know, it's in the press. We know that it's coming and it must be very exciting. Yeah, so we've got a small team in Joburg that are working incredibly hard to move uh, from where they are right now, which is a staff beta, and to make that beta broader. And we'll probably be making a couple of announcements um, to the market in the next few weeks or so. But it's going to be a slow launch. We're not going to do anything with fanfare. Yes. Um, but the nice thing about Bank Zero is it's a completely mobile bank plus a card, and we want to democratize finance. And what those big words mean is we just think that many banking fees, all the electronic banking fees and card swipe fees are too high in South Africa. And if we can make them very low, even zero, there is a hint in the name, we think many more people can join the banking system. And we can also bring relief to the business segment. So Bank Zero is very, very focused on the business segment in South Africa, which are the employment creators. But it's also the segment that, as you know, is under pressure right now of, after the lockdown. So we're still very excited to to go into a beta mode in, in, uh, in a couple of weeks' time um, and brings exciting new features to the South African market. But more about that later, and uh, I'll be sure to invite you, Aki. 
we can't wait, Michael. We can't wait. And my last question, I mean, everybody looks up to you as a you know, very successful man. You've got a great insight into looking for good businesses and you're an entrepreneur. It runs through your blood. What, what, and, 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 you know, I would imagine during this crisis, there are going to be thousands of entrepreneurs that are going to be born that have started something new. What is your advice and your tips in, in, in 30 seconds? If you met an entrepreneur, a young guy, uh, somebody starting a business, what would you tell them to stick to those basics to be successful as you are? So, so Aki, I, I, I find in South Africa that people are very enamored with ideas, so much so that they underestimate execution or getting it done. So the, the, the nine out of 10 people come and they want to pitch an idea and they want to sign a non-disclosure. I tell them the idea is nothing. Ideas are easy. Ideas are cheap. It's all about the execution. So start executing as soon as possible. Come up with what people call an MVP, a minimum viable product, as soon as possible. Put it in the market so that you can see what customers think of it. And then adapt. Be agile. Listen to those customers and try and make the first 10 or first 100 incredibly happy. Once you've done that, the rest is actually quite easy. So the difficult thing is get really good with execution. And then if I can just add one more thing, the whole secret to life is people. So you're going to be as successful as the people that you surround yourself with. So when you want to build a business, just make sure that you have good partners, people that you can do a deal with on a handshake. It doesn't all have to be written on paper because you trust each other and also because they can implement well. And if you okay. can do those, those two things, you should be successful. Fantastic. Michael, thank you. And uh, before you go, I know that wine is a great passion of yours. Have you had any really good, exceptional wine in the last three months that you've had a sip and you said, oh, this stuff is amazing. Give us that wine, please. Uh, I, I'm, I'm really going to struggle to not, not uh, punt my own wine, uh, Barton and or Monte oh, Gray. Yeah, yeah. You know, again, and we were so um, lucky and privileged to be living on a wine farm. So while you know, people weren't able to go and replenish their cellars, we were literally sitting on a, on a lake of wine and I must say, it, it is a great joy of mine to, at the, at the end of a long day's work, to sit and look over the valley and enjoy a good glass of red wine. It's one of life's um, pleasures. And I, I, I just wish that more people could do that because it's healthy, makes you feel better, and that you can come up with great business concepts over a good glass of red wine. Michael Jordan, a serial entrepreneur, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting to you. Glad to see you looking so well. And thank you for your time. And we wish you every success in the future with uh, Bank Zero, uh, you know, Rain, whichever investments you have where you've got your finger in many pies. Thank you for your time. And we wish you all the best. Thank you, Aki. Great talking to you. Likewise.